so since most of you are having coffee, I'll, I promised Matthias I would uh, do mostly demo. So I have a few slides uh, which I'll browse through pretty quickly just to leave as a reference for you later on so you can download it somewhere. I'll send them off to, to the Beam Summit. Uh, and the, the, the question I've, I've had, how did I end up here? Um, and so the, the Kettle project has been around for 17 years now. It's, it's pretty mature and um, it got acquired by uh, Hitachi Vantara a few years ago. And so I left the company last year to, to join Neo4j. And Neo4j is, is the coolest graph database on the planet, right? <laughs> um, Neo4j does something unique that nobody else does. It, it, it allows you to run uh, graph algorithms on, on your data. It can find paths between uh, pieces of information. For example, how are two customers related in any form? They might, oh, you might find that in the graph it says that they live in the same town maybe or they use the same product. And so we use these graph algorithms to run a, a whole variety of business use cases, recommendation engines, uh, fraud detection. So that, that's basically where most of our business is coming from, a very fast growing business. And it all lives in the digital transformation space. So companies that want to do something different than their competitors. This is also the space I believe that Apache Beam lives in. And so when uh, our company, Neo4j, launched uh, their uh, uh, clustered uh, database as a service uh, platform on uh, Google Cloud Platform initially, and was announced uh, earlier this year, a few months ago, on, at Google I.O., uh, I thought it was a good idea to, to have our data loading pipelines into Neo4j also run on Apache Beam, because then we have Google Cloud uh, Platform uh, data flow, but also Spark, Flink, and the others. So if you want to know more about Neo4j, uh, there's, if you go to neo4j.com uh, or this URL, you can download a free book. So uh, my colleagues uh, Mark and Amy wrote a whole book. And it also covers the, no, the new uh, Spark 3.0 uh, graph query language integration that was done uh, into Spark 3.0. Cypher for, Neo for, for, uh, for Spark, it's called. Pretty cool stuff, right? It allows you to run uh, graph queries on your uh, big data sets. So a little bit about Kettle. Um, Kettle is a metadata-driven uh, data integration tool. So it allows you to define your workloads uh, using a GUI. So that's been around for, yeah, like, like I said, uh, 15 years, 16 years. Uh, and once you define that workload, that metadata, describing how a process needs to be executed, you can run it anywhere, right? Um, everywhere you have a JVM, you can, you can run it. In the past, we've run uh, Kettle inside of mappers and reducers and combiners, but also Spark uh, in the enterprise edition of, uh, of Kettle and Storm. So definition of metadata, you configure some options and you execute which is very similar to how Apache Beam works, if you think about it. So you define an Apache Beam pipeline. The only difference is that in Kettle, the, the execution engine is completely separate from the definition of the workload. So, um, so we recognize architectural similarities. And the differences are uh, the mixture of code and pipeline structure in, in Beam. But that actually made things a lot easier for us. And so now we have the ability to run our kettle transformations, we call them, as pipelines. Right? And since the schemas were kind of missing um, originally when I started this, uh, I started defining uh, my own file definitions. And I will jump into that in the demo a, later, a little bit later. And um, so yeah, we started building uh, more and more integration uh, we have a GUI integration with metrics so you know how many records got processed in each of the uh, functions and, and transforms in the Beam pipelines. And we supported, you know, three main platforms, Dataflow, Spark, and Flink, and obviously the direct runner as well. Um, we have um, 
supported most of the functionality in the Kettle engine and all of the steps, which means that you now have hundreds and hundreds of uh, uh, features, functions. I will, I will go over them in a bit. Uh, but that means that if you have weird things that you need to do, uh, read data from Salesforce or an Excel file or something weird, right? Uh, you can just use Kettle to do that. You don't need to, to figure out what kind of API, what kind of hoops you need to jump through. And steps that were converted are things like um, uh, group by and merge join, like we saw earlier. It can be a bit of a pain to write the code for it, but once we've done it in a graphical user interface, you can just uh, generate that code, well, actually just use that code, right? We've also added a bunch of extra steps to directly support the Google, Google uh, the, sorry, the, uh, the, the YO steps. Uh, for uh, Google Cloud Platform, BigQuery, PubSub, Kafka, obviously. Um, and so for streaming, we also added a bunch of stuff because uh, while Kettle is a streaming engine uh, by nature, it, it didn't really have concepts like windowing and timestamps. So we just added a few uh, icons in, the, in our palette. And so we now have uh, these uh, functions, right? If you know a bit about the, G the Beam API, that's a, that's a nice thing about presenting here. I don't have to <laughs> explain this, right? Um, so you can just use the, these, and I'll show some demos. Let's dive right into it. I kept this slide deck as, as simple as possible. All right. So. So our, our uh, user interface is called Spoon. How does this work? All right. So the way that uh, Spoon works is that um, you can just create a transformation, which is in Beam terminology a pipeline, right? In this case, we are reading from a Beam uh, uh, Kafka consumer, and I set up uh, something on my sandbox, I read from a topic, I get a key and a message back. So that's all you need to know from a GUI perspective in, in the Kettle world. We just define the minimal things that you need to get this up and running. Behind the scenes, uh, we have the code to make that work on our execution engine. Same for parsing JSON. So you might say, okay, I have a message, not reading from a file, and I have a bunch of uh, JSON uh, paths and string, and I have uh, data type conversions. So this, this data flows through this whole pipeline. And the cool thing about it is then you can say, well, um, just create a unit test. So now I have input data for this thing. I can preview the data. I can see, okay, I have a JSON. Does this I have some JSON in my data? And you can actually click on the steps and see how this data gets parsed here. So I can get the beers out of this thing. There's some, some bad data in here. I'm going to remove some asterisks. Because if, you, if you're working out in the field, it's never like a simple pipeline, right? It's never simple like uh, I'm going to read something, I'm going to aggregate, I'm going to write. No, there's always bad data. There's always junk in there. There's always like stuff you need to convert, filter out. This is, it's never, never that easy. And before you know it, you create like these whole Java projects and pipelines that are actually whole development projects. So we recognize this. And tools like uh, Kettle, Talent, NiFi, what we try to do is minimize the maintenance cost and development cost uh, by allowing you to see if things are working as fast as possible. So fail early. So we, if we look at the big data world, I think the number is something over 80% of all big data projects fail. That's an impressive number if you think about it. And when I talk to customers the last couple of months, what they're saying is like, yeah, we, we've had like this Spark developer, and he worked on a project for us. And after three months, he got something working. And then he had Spark on his CV, and then he had a better deal at another company, and he left. And now we're stuck with code that we don't know how it works. 
And so this is becoming a major issue because all you guys, you really want it in the big, in the big data market, right? If you now know Apache Beam as well, you're like really, you get really great job offers all over the place. And that's, a, that's an issue for us as customers, especially for, for us Neo4j in the digital transformation space. In a fast growing business, we don't have enough people. All our, our field engineers are 100% busy. It's like incredible, right? <laughs> it's a really good thing, but at the same time, uh, we, need to, we need to figure something out. So this is now something that we have uh, you know, you, you have this ability to use tools like Kettle, like Talent, to, to develop faster and, and deploy your, your, uh, your jobs faster. So in this case, uh, so you can develop this transformation locally with, with local test data. And the cool thing is now, this was running like with a local runner, but we have one for Dataflow as well. And I actually can't execute this because it's already running. Uh, Sergey tricked me into running it already. Uh, so let's go take a look. Um, so, so this is where it's running. So uh, this, this transformation gets really converted into a beam pipeline and executed here. And um, so let me just push some data in there that it's actually let me just push some data into the Kafka queue, otherwise it's sitting idle. Uh, but it's been, uh, it's been processing some data. Uh, I've been adding like counters into every function that corresponds to a step in, tra in the transformation so that I know how many records are processed. And um, so now you, you basically uh, see like the whole pipeline all the way up to the update of a Neo4j thing. And this can be running like indefinitely. Uh, we have other examples maybe where, uh, let's take a simple example to get started. Um, this is too big. Let me just, this is too small. How about this? Yeah, so, so a very simple example where uh, we start with a, a file definition. This was my idea of having a schema. Because if you, if you look for um, um, the file definition, in this case, customers, it's basically exactly that, right? You have uh, your data types, your field names. And in this case, it's a file definition. In the later phase, I want to extend this to also uh, support other file formats, like uh, Parquet maybe, Avro, those are popular these days. And um, that would just convert into a different YO uh, usage in the background for us, right? Should be simple. For now, it's just CSV files that we, that we do. Um, so this is a simple pipeline. Just start somewhere and it ends some, somewhere. What you will notice is the usage of uh, these dollar signs, these variables. And so this allows us to say, okay, uh, in my beam configuration, let's say I'm using a local Flink runner. Uh, so Flink, local engine, um, my parameters for these variables are simply the environment home and a local execution engine and some output folder. Uh, for the, um, let's say, data flow. For data flow, you might have a, a huge file or a folder full of files. It might be gigabytes. And it would point to a, to a different location, in this case, a Google uh, Cloud Storage location. Uh, so this makes it possible for us to say, OK, I'm just going to run this on Dataflow now. OK, and what would happen on the, let's take a look. On the Dataflow side is after a few seconds where it verifies that it has the right fat jar and everything, um, it will start a process. Uh, let's hope my phone doesn't die. Here you go. Uh, <laughs> so now it's, 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 it's firing up all the scaling. It's firing up, a, uh, a, I guess, a Docker container, right? <laughs> yeah, Sergey, it's a Docker container. Uh, but in any case, um, what we will also get is the metrics here uh, from the Beam API, the metrics 
will be reflected in the in the GUI, and this helps you kind of get a feel for how many records already are already processed. You get more insights into what's going on in that remote uh, Docker container, because we risk creating black boxes. In the next phase, I actually want to have our code is running out there, and it has all sorts of plugins in there. We want to I want to actually send sample data back, so that I don't only get metrics, but also get like. Uh, rows of data, snippets, like pieces of, uh, of uh, information to make it more open and visual. Because uh, if, you, if you process a trillion rows, you want to know that you're doing something right, not wait like four days and then see, oh, no, I, I made a mistake, right? So this is also the, the whole goal behind saying, OK, I'm going to write unit tests. I'm going to test locally with a, with a local runner before I'm going to run on uh, the big machines where it costs real money. Real energy, real uh, <laughs> yeah, real big money, right? Um, so, so now you see that it's actually started to run. Uh, I'm getting information from uh, Dataflow. Uh, for Spark and Flink, things are not that easy, though. Uh, Google yeah, GCP Dataflow is is really cool because it does more than the other runners in the sense that it. It also does the, the Spark submit uh, Flink run for you, and it allows you to interact remotely through the Beam API. If we want to run the same thing on uh, Flink, I uh, set up uh, Flink 1.8. Uh, I just tested my job that it works, right? But then I'll, I'll run it again. Uh, here's my server um, Flink. 1.8. Think here it is. So I wrote a script which is basically doing the same thing. Uh, maybe just show this. It's doing the same thing. So I wrote the main Flink class, and you can define parallelism, specify which fat jar to to use. Which is uh, now this part, and these parts are things. I now defined in my beam config, so I can I think can take them out in the next version. So this will disappear in a, in a short amount of time, which will leave you with the Flink server, the kettle metadata to use, which is th which are things like the Neo4j connection information, everything that it needs to run uh, gets uh, transferred into a JSON file and sent off to the nodes, and so you end up with a transformation and some metadata which doesn't change usually. So all it ends is Basically, this. So you run with a certain piece of information, the kettle transformation. And what is that kettle transformation? It's just XML. Um, so this, yeah, I'm a VI user. So this is just this is just XML defining what needs to happen. There's no code in here, nothing. Okay. So uh, again, we just run this. And so it's exactly the same thing for uh, as for Dataflow, but then just running on the Flink master or Spark master, right? And uh, you, you get some output saying, OK, this is how I uh, can create my pipeline. Let's just do this quickly before the general. Are there any questions about these topics right now? Any, any concerns? No? Then I'll just keep going. <laughs> All right. So uh, making things easy, making things useful, um, that's, that's kind of like what we're doing. So this is the, the cool part is that uh, we now have an environment where you can uh, leverage all the things that you've learned about Kettle and all the books that are available, all the uh, YouTube videos, all the expertise that is out there. And we can start bringing the two communities together. So I've asked Matthias to, to come and present a Beam deep dive talk at the Kettle Community Meetup in Antwerp, uh, November 22nd, 23rd. We'll have a Beam meetup, uh, a Kettle me uh, meetup, community meetup. So I want to cordially invite you there as well. And uh, so I think the, the Neo4j community, the Kettle community, and the Beam community have a lot to offer each other. And so that's. 
Everything I'm showing you, by the way, is Apache licensed. So there's no, just, just before I get that question later on. So every, every, all the code, Kettle, the whole code, but also Kettle Beam, everything is Apache licensed. And obviously Beam and all the Apache stuff we're using is also Apache licensed. So which means that you can just take this for whatever it's worth. Um, I have created a kettle.be website, which is the, the old website I resurrected last year. And um, so the, 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 the software I'm using right now is uh, uh, the B kettle beam 0 0.6, which is still a beam 2.12, I think. So in the next week, I'll be updating this to the first 1.0 beta, which is what I'm showing right now. Uh, my community members simply do a Maven clean install <laughs> and use that. Um, but for, for some users, it's easy to just download something. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm putting that up for you guys here. Um, but I'm also inviting you to our Kettle community Slack channel. Um, Kettle community.slack.com. Uh, but because of the nature of Slack, you'll have to send me a email. So mattcasters at gmail.com or matt.casters at neo4j.com. You'll figure it out. And I'll, I'll invite you to. We have a bunch of people on the Beam mailing list now as well. And the way that usually goes is I downloaded your software. I tried the Beam stuff, and I ran on Google Cloud Platform. There's some blog posts explaining how to set up security. Because that's, that's the, Sergey, that's the hardest part of, of Dataflow, is setting up security <laughs> right now. And then they go like, yeah, this, this just works, right? Now I can roll my click tech data into, into BigQuery or whatever. Let's, let's jump into a few more examples. Uh, so this is one example where uh, we're, we're, testing, we're test casing all the, the, hard, the hard parts. Um, so for example, this, this here, uh, this is called a stream lookup in Kettle, but it's, it's the same thing as site loading in, in Apache Beam. So we're loading a bunch of data into memory, and we use this to populate a hash set to, so that we can do streaming lookups on this, on this data. Um, so we have um, states, a million records. There's, there's data per states, per 52 states. And we say we count the number of records per state. Uh, now I need to remember, yeah. So in here, um, this memory group by is the same. It's converted into a group by, group by key into Apache Beam. And so we haven't really supported all the features here because there's like standard deviation and a bunch of them. And not all of them can be uh, converted into parallel algorithms that run on Beam. So if you're using one of them that doesn't work, you get an error during pipeline creation. Really sorry. <laughs> I haven't found a good solution for those yet, but yeah. You have to live with it for now. Um, uh, merge join, uh, I've, like I told Sergey, I've hit a little bit of a problem. It works really fine. It uses the, the join library, except for data flow, which is kind of slow. So I'll, I'll fire up a mail on the user list, and we'll, we'll discuss that further. Uh, so all the all the issues that the, the previous presenter had, all the all the snags, all the caveats, I've run into all of them basically, right? I've, I've hit them all, um, and I've solved them all so that you don't have to worry about them anymore if you're using Kettle. Um, this so filtering rows. So if then over here, else over there. Uh, this is using uh, directed pipelines. So you're sending um, data off to specific uh, transforms. And the extreme case of that is obviously the, the switch case. So all of these uh, special cases work fine. And you, you can make them run. Um, how much time do I have? I'm almost, almost out of time, I think, right? Five minutes? Team, 10 minutes? 15, oh, that's cool. So let's take a look at our, our uh, fling job then. Um, where it is. So yeah, that, that completed just fine. If you, uh, in our case, we created an output folder here. Um, output. And you can see that basically it's, it's doing what we expect it to do, filter out the, the, the California 
states doing an uppercase. And it's very similar to what you see in the, in the Python code, like pipe this, pipe that. These are the steps and the, the hops connected. Um, all right. What else can we show? Um, oh, yeah, windowing. So for windowing, um, we created like a few extra steps, like I said. Uh, so, for timestamping, sometimes we need to not pick up the timestamp from the JSON message, but the timestamp stamp inside the message. Uh, so, to modify basically the timestamp on the on the records in the P collection, and so this is why we have uh, the beam timestamp step that we created. You can also use it to get the timestamp from a stream if you maybe want to do some calculations on it, calculate the date or, or, or the month or whatever. Um, and for windowing, we support all the windowing that is supported by the Beam API. And so this makes it very easy, for example, to set up like this transformation, which basically does a count per window and then uh, writes uh, window to some folder. Right. If you run this again on uh, Dataflow, it will just create files in, in Google Storage. Every five minutes, you get another file. Counts per rep, per per uh, uh, per time. Any questions about this so far? All right. So we don't need to use any kind of file definitions on the output side because if you look at this thing, um, so you kind of know what the output is at every location. So you can ask, show me the output fields. Show me the output fields. And so, so the metadata wise, Kettle has a strict separation of metadata and data for performance reasons. Um, so it just flows through this whole thing. Let's take a little bit of a look, since we have time, into the actual code of how this is happening. Uh, so the Kettle Beam project has. Um, two parts, a core part which has uh, the plumbing. So we have a coder. Now, incidentally, if you want to look at how to implement a coder, how to implement a uh, special functions to do, to do what, this is actually a great example project now. I've, I've forwarded a few links to GitHub to a few user questions on, on the Beam uh, user list. Um, uh, functions to do uh, string to kettle row conversion and vice versa. All these like um, uh, you know basic plumbing things for Google pub sub for publishing and uh, reading. All these messages, all these converters, they're, they're all in here. And then for the transforms, you know, if you have a uh, let's say Kafka input transforms, uh, how that gets translated into um, Basically, the Kafka YO call. So, the the metadata here, um, the topics, the to reads, and everything comes from uh, from above, right? From the pipeline builder. So, I've created at some point a kettle a pipeline builder, and the the pipeline builder. Oh, thanks. Uh, starts from the kettle metadata, and so what we, so so this this builds like a, a whole bunch of, but for for all steps it's fine except for special steps. So I created this notion of of step handlers. Uh, so for the exceptions, the BigQuery, the, all the things that are natively supported by uh, uh, big, by by Beam, uh, we have uh, special special handlers. And then obviously a generic uh, step handler for, for the rest. Uh, I invite you to, to join our community if, you, if you're interested in, in uh, seeing this. If you have any practical cases, if you have any customers that might be interested in this, I'll be happy to work with you. Uh, but towards the end of the year, I want to have a few uh, people, in, a few customers in production actually on this. Um, so yeah, my, my time is up. If there's any questions, I would li love to hear them. Uh, maybe take this mic. To, and if, if not, I will catch you during the breaks. And I will be happy to give you a live demo on my laptop. 
And now I need to remember to shut down that uh, Kafka demo, otherwise I have $100 bills tomorrow. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much for this presentation. Now we would like to open the floor for questions. So please just raise your hand if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, so, which runners are you using or are you supporting with Kettle? Uh, which runners can you run your pipelines on? Dataflow and what else? Uh, so, Dataflow, um, let me just open this up. So, Dataflow was the first one that we supported. And um, uh, obviously, because it's, it's not always easy to just fire up a whole Spark cluster or Flink cluster. Um, so Dataflow was the first one to, to, to get supported. And so we've solved this by adding special taps for the, for the runners. So for Dataflow, we support uh, most of the options, I think all of the options in the runner, including the, uh, the size of the, of the instance to use, and even um, where to run it, you know, run in Belgium or in, uh, in Taiwan or whatever. So this is very convenient for people. They don't have to look up which code to use for their runner, and you know we do the translation behind it. I would prefer maybe to to see this. Uh, maybe I should. Maybe it would be great if I could do some web service call to Google somewhere and get the list of, of available options so I can populate this dialog. But other than that, it's it's all fine, right? It's not like you build a new data center every week, right? <laughs> and the other ones are Spark and Flink. Uh, those three are the, the main ones. But now that these three are done, plus the direct runner, um, I think it should be very easy to add other ones, right? It's, it's all rinse and repeat. Uh, and in the Spark and Flink options, are you running on the Beam runner, so are you directly running the jobs on the clusters, like Spark clusters and Flink clusters? So, so we use the, the, the Spark and Flink runners. But we have to execute those on the on the Spark and Flink master. We can't execute it directly from uh, from within uh, Kettle Spoon. So doing that orchestration is also a goal of the project. Toward the end of the year, I'm probably going to run like a small servlet on the server on the Beam and Flink master, so that I can get access remotely from it. So we have like a small web server. It's a Jetty server that we can use to do rem remote execution. And so that would be useful to do orchestration then, and also get metrics back from the server. So I think that would would be really nice, so that you you just run in in the GUI as well, right? But not just in the GUI, but also in the batch processing. So this is the runner, just run it, because it's completely integrated with with the rest of the tool set. Any other questions? There's one more question, okay. and then we'll have to wrap up this session. Yeah, then we'll. I, I really like your tool there, it's really cool. But I didn't see anything related to costs. Or are you able to also pull some information back, like uh, how much a job actually costs on Flink, Spark, Dataflow, and so on? Price-wise, you mean? The cost price-wise? The cost price-wise, yes. No, I'm not doing that yet. It would be a great feature. Yeah, it would be great. But, but again, um, is that is that somewhere available in the Beam API or somewhere? I think it's available given the resources that you select, okay. the time of the running of the job, or the uptime of the job, maybe. So it might be a calculation formula. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, I would be happy to, to learn that. Or even you know get cost estimate before you run, right? That would be even better. Yeah, But you know. Uh, for 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 the testing I've done so far, it's been really cheap, right? I get like bills like twenty dollars for a month or something. It's, it's but yeah, if you if you do larger data sets, that's a good point. Yeah, but I'll be happy to to accept suggestions. We have an issues channel on the GitHub project, so uh, GitHub.com slash Mattcaster slash Kettle dash Beam. Um, but I'll forward the slide deck, and there are links in there uh, so you can follow us and join us. Hey, thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate you so it. much, Matt. <laughs>